Turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. And I'll be reading to you the portion that took place, the incidents that took place on the Wednesday of the Passion Week. And a few selected verses as also being displayed on the screen. And uh, if you're there, at Matthew 26, first would be from verses 1 to 4, and then 6 to 7, and then 14 to 16. This is a section about a plot against Jesus. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Verses 14 to 16. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would continue to minister to us as you have been doing over the last few days. And every single day of our life, open our ears, our hearts, our minds to listen and grasp and respond to the way that you want us to live today and for the rest of the days that you have given by grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled this evening's meditation as the mystery of being Judas. This is the greatest betrayal of human history, as if I would look at if any betrayal stories that we would know. This is one of the greatest betrayal stories that we could read. Now this is, as we understand, being the very third day of the Holy Week or the Passion Week, and we find that Jesus was nearing the end of his public ministry, and we find that this Passover festival was rapidly approaching. And scripture tells us in the book of, in the gospel of John that after raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus knew that the chief priests were plotting his death and so he did not want to walk openly uh, among the Jews. But we come to understand that he instead went to a city in Ephraim or city of Ephraim, a city near the wilderness. Now, six days before the Passover, which was yesterday's theme, Jesus, we find, has returned back to Bethany uh, to find some rest and encouragement that we find here in today's uh, reading. He's reclining at the table in a man's name, in a house uh, of the man's name is Simon the leper, who was having some serious difficulty, and we don't know if he was healed for that matter. Now, he's in the home of the Simon the leper, and Jesus knew that in just a couple of days, he would face the agony of Gethsemane and also the suffering of Calvary. While this passage is given to us in the form of a historical narrative, nevertheless, it is still very instructive. Now, I want to concentrate on the climax of the third day of the Passion Week, which we call as Pi Wednesday, and some would call it as silent Wednesday because we don't find Jesus doing anything except for the matter that he was taking rest and speaking few words of wisdom to his disciples about the woman who came with the alabaster jar of oil. However, I want to concentrate on spy Wednesday and not silent Wednesday uh, for this meditation. And this is the incident of Judas betraying Jesus. We know that Judas had become evil so that he became so evil that he was willing now to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. As we know that in that context, 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. And later, when he was overcome by remorse, he committed suicide. 
there are six suicides recorded in the Bible, and this is one suicide that is recorded in the New Testament, all the five in the Old Testament. Now, truly, Judas is a mystery for me, and that is why I title that as the mystery of being Judas. No other apostle fascinates the mind like Judas, at least for me. All the other disciples we can understand. We can understand Peter, James, John, and the rest of the other disciples. We can understand them to some you know, enormity of whatever they did. But Judas remains a mystery wrapped in a riddle, if you would allow me to say that. If Judas wanted to see Jesus die at midnight, by sunrise he had changed his mind, he wanted Jesus to live. You know, in the fact, in the final act of this man who could not live with the thoughts that went across his mind, who could not live with himself, of the memory of what he had done few hours earlier, the ultimate irony of his tragic day of suicide is that Judas died before Jesus did. Now that is very tragic. He betrays the man whom he wants to sell off, but he dies one, a few hours earlier than Jesus did. If Jesus is willing to pay with his blood for the crime that Judas had done, Judas, on the other hand, had already paid the ultimate price for his crime of betrayal. If we go to the very beginning of uh, Judas' story, we find remarkable facts about him, and I was studying, and these are a few facts I want to present to you tonight. Now, first of all, we know that he was personally chosen to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, this is surely a great venture for those people. He was personally chosen by Jesus Christ. He left everything else. We don't know what he was doing, but then he left that, and he started following Jesus Christ. He spent three and a half years traveling the length and breadth of Israel along with Jesus and the rest of the 11 disciples. He saw all the miracles of Jesus Christ in person firsthand. He was an eyewitness. He heard Christ give all his famous sermons and famous discourses. He heard it all. He couldn't have missed anyone. He watched as Christ healed the sick, raised the dead, and also cast out demons. He had first-hand evidence to all these things that we wish we could have seen when Jesus was around. He was sent out to preach the gospel along with the other apostles. Now, this is even more interesting. He was sent to preach the gospel along with the other apostles, and he went. No one ever suspected him of treason. In terms of experience, whatever you can say about Peter, James, and John, you might as well say about Judas Iscariot. You cannot say that he was not as experienced as the rest of the other disciples. None of us can say that. Because he had every other opportunity that the 11 disciples had. Judas was one whom the disciples would hand the money over. Judas was the one whom the disciples chose, isn't it? They chose Judas to handle the money. If he was a thief, as John puts it later in the gospel, they would not have given him you know, the money to be handled. But then they did. That means he had given such a good rapport about who he was that nobody even dreamt that he could commit a treason. You don't pick a person to handle your money if you suspect his or her loyalty, would you? You'll never make them the treasurer of any organization or a church or an institution. If you trust that person's loyalty, you would. If you don't trust, then you wouldn't. But in this case, they trusted Judas Iscariot's loyalty, and that's why he became the treasurer of this group. You pick the best. You pick the trustworthy person. You pick a person whom you can count on to handle your money, and that's why they picked up Judas Iscariot. They never dreamt that Judas was in some way or the other grooving betrayal in his heart. They found his conduct to be above suspicion all these years that they were with him. If you would think if a man was as evil enough to betray Jesus, it would show in his face, isn't it? You know when the bubbles start coming out of the gutter that that is not true of the, of, of the water that we see, it is bad. 
But it never happened with Judas. No one suspected him. The Greek word for betraying is paradidomai, and which means hand over or cause one to be taken. Now you find this word in the Old Testament 200 times, and in the New Testament it appears 120 times. It is now AD 65 when Matthew is, uh, is writing what we just read, okay? In AD 65, 30 years have passed since this incident that he's recording about has gone by in Matthew 26. It is a historical narrative. And Matthew sits down to write his gospel after 30 years after the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And when he writes the names of the disciples as he recollects, you'll find this in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4, Judas is always mentioned last. Not just Judas, but Judas who betrayed him. When you come to Mark chapter 3 and verse 19, when Mark writes his gospel with the help of Peter, this is the same again, Judas who betrayed him. When you come down to Luke chapter 6 and verse 16, he writes his gospel with the help of Paul. It is the same again. Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. And then when you come down to the gospel of John, now John is writing after 60 years after this incident has taken place. Then 30 years, in fact, after Matthew has written, he's writing in AD 90. And he writes his gospel in chapter 12 and verse 4 to 6. He calls Judas Judas who was later to betray him. Now why am I saying this? It is as if these disciples never got over of what happened. Though many decades, 30 to 60 years, six decades until John was writing, have passed by, this incident did not reduce the enormity of Judas' crime. It was as shocking to these disciples in their old age as it had been when they were young. They could not get over it. They could not believe it. That is why it is the mystery of being Judas. Judas, who was one of the, uh, one of the 12, there's one verse in the New Testament in the gospel where it says, Judas, who was one of the 12, at one point of time, what it means is he experienced Jesus up close and personal. He was one of the 12, not the betrayer at that point of time, who could, when we think about a man whom you could say he was one of the 12, who could think that he could become a traitor? When Judas responded to Christ's call, did he join with an intention to become a betrayer? Did he join to become a traitor? Absolutely not. From everything that we know and we understand from the New Testament Gospels, Judas must have been a sincere follower as anyone else, as the rest of the 11. Exactly where, when, how and why that feeling of anger came upon Judas against Jesus, I don't know and none of us can say. Though they were becoming dominantly progressive over these three years. Circumstances, my friends, changed Judas into a traitor even though he began as a sincere disciple of Jesus Christ. Any one of us can become traitors Circumstances can lead us to become like Judas. This is the tragedy of life. The tragedy of Judas' life. Circumstances changed Judas into a traitor even though he became a sincere disciple of Jesus in the beginning. Now we come to a very crucial question this evening. Why did Judas do it? Why did Judas do it? I want to present to you three hypotheses the gospel writers don't give us any clues. In fact, if they do, they give us very few uh, clues. It is likely that they never knew the answer either. Since Judas committed suicide within few hours after his betrayal, we don't have his statement for sure of the story. So therefore, we are left to speculate at least three possible hypotheses, which I would presume would be theories. So we have that one number one. He betrayed Jesus for money. Now the problem with this hypothesis is that 30 pieces of silver, as I said at the early part of my sermon, was not very much, it was not a much, uh, you know, it was not something that you could betray somebody for. It was the price of a slave. It was the price of a slave. You could not sell Jesus for the price of a slave if he wanted to make money. If greed was Judas' motivation, he had very little to show for his trouble. 
So I don't agree with that part uh, in terms of the hypothesis being right. He could not have betrayed Jesus for money. The second hypothesis is that he betrayed Jesus because he was disillusioned whether Jesus was a political messiah who had come to lead the nation of Israel to overthrow the monarchy and the anarchy of Rome. Maybe, we don't know. Judas didn't want a kingdom in the future or in the next world. He wanted a kingdom now, as many would want their kingdom now. Judas wanted a kingdom here and now. He did not want to wait for the future. He wanted a political messiah. So it is possible that Judas was motivated by the greed and the ambition to accomplish his own mission, not the mission of Jesus. And therefore he betrayed Jesus because he had become thoroughly disillusioned who Jesus is. And so he said, you know, I have nothing to do with this man. You know, I don't think he's that potential Messiah that I was thinking about. I made a wrong choice by joining this team. I better betray him. But again, this problem of the hypothesis is, uh, it is not very convincing in terms of uh, for betraying him for that reason. He could have just moved out of the team. The final one is what I usually agree with, that final hypothesis. He betrayed Jesus because he was frightened. I'll tell you why. This uh, theory suggests that once he knew that the handwriting was on the wall, we read that, isn't it? The chief priests and the, peop the priests, they were planning to kill Jesus. Now that is there all through. He knew, Jesus knew that he was about to be killed. He knew that the plot was being set up. He knew the schemes that were happening around him. And the handwriting was on the wall. They knew the story, what was going to happen. He went on to meet the high priest, this uh, Judas, with a scheme in order to save his own skin, if you would allow me to say that. By now it was very clear that the religious leaders were closing in on Jesus. They had too much of Jesus. They didn't want him anymore. So Jesus' days were numbered and Jesus himself was talking more and more now about his death. He was vehemently talking about going to the Father and how you know, intentionally emotional and also excited he is to go back to the Father. And he was talking even more vehemently about the death that he was going to go through as well. So, but the situation is this. Once they capture Jesus, what would happen to the disciples? You put yourself in today's situation. You know, you put a person who is leading the team, who is leading an association, who is leading some kind of a march, and it is very much against the government rule. Once you catch the leader, the supporters have no face at all in that given society. Several possibilities would come to mind, my dear friends. The disciples would be arrested along with Jesus. Now, that was the fear that Judas had. If this man is going to surrender, if he is not the potential Messiah, then I myself would be arrested and eventually I would also have the death penalty. And the things that were going on, all of them could be put to death. So Judas might have betrayed Jesus simply because he wanted to save himself. Now all of these theories might contribute to explain why Judas did what he did. But in one sense his motives, precisely why he did what he did, will always or possibly at, as, at this part of the eternity would be mystery to us. He planned to betray Jesus, that you can't deny. He approached the chief priest with the purpose and with the idea to betray Jesus. That's another thing that you can't deny. And then he made the deal and took the money. All this means that he planned to betray Jesus and that's exactly what he did. Guilty as charged as you would say that in the modern terms. You know, during the Last Supper, which we will obviously study tomorrow, Jesus makes an announcement that shocks the disciples. I don't know if you had any shocking announcements, but then this is one in the Bible. And the shocking announcement that Jesus makes to his disciples is that one of you will betray me. Now that is a cryptic comment that is made by Jesus in all that he spoke. It says in Matthew 26, the same chapter in verse 23, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. It was very evident who is going to do it. 
So Jesus took the bread, dipped it in the wine sauce, and gave it to Judas with the words that you read in John 13, 27. What you are about to do, do quickly. Now, Bible scholars tell us that the Passover symbolism as it was, the wine sauce was representing the fruit of the promised land. When Jesus gave Judas the bread, he was not merely identifying him as the one who is going to betray him, but rather he was giving him, or rather making, asking a last appeal to Judas to change his mind. I hope you understand. In the Greek, it is very evident that you understand it the way it has to be written, but in the English, it gives you different possibilities to wind up with your own assumptions. But in the Greek, it is simple. Jesus is saying here, Judas, I know what is in your heart, but now the moment for decision has come. You can either betray me or you can follow me. What you are about to do, do quickly. Will you follow me or will you betray me? Either way, do that decision quickly. Take your decision now. It is one final hour of grace for Judas. It could be for us too at any given moment of time when God knows that you are going on a very thin line between betrayal and truly remaining as God's disciple. However, we know that Judas took the bread and immediately left the room to go make arrangements with the soldiers. Now John tells us in John 13, 27, as soon as he took the bread, what happened? Satan entered into him. And in verse 30 it says, and it was night. A lot of symbolism there, if we read in those, uh, you know, lenses. However, we know that Judas left the team, left the disciples, left Jesus, and he left the light of the world and vanished into the presence of the prince of darkness. That is into the night. He leaves the light of the world and goes to the presence of the prince of darkness. When you get down, right down to it, we would be quite mistaken if we categorize Judas alongside someone like Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein. If we do that, we miss the point of the entire story of Judas or being Judas. If we think Judas is like Hitler or Osama bin Laden, then we miss the lesson of this life. We miss the lesson of Judas' life. The point is, my friend, whatever happened to Judas, could happen to me, could happen to you, could happen to anyone who thinks they're very strong in the Lord. What he did, we could do. I could betray and you could betray as well. If we think otherwise, then we have missed the story in its entirety. If we are sitting tonight and listening to this sermon and meditating upon and studying those words and thinking that I will never end up doing that, you are wrong. I would be wrong. If I preach a sermon to say that you'll never do this. Judas is a lot like any one of us and we are a lot like Judas. In fact, the more religious we are, the more like Judas we will become. The more religious we are, the more like Judas we will become. That is the mystery of being Judas today. And therefore the question is, are you religious or are you spiritual? That is the riddle of having the spirit of Judas. And I'm telling you that the spirit of Judas is right now here in the church as it was with the team of the 12 disciples. The spirit of Judas is always there to betray Jesus. Judas is not alive today. Yes, of course he's not. He's gone to his place as Peter says. We don't know whether it is heaven or hell. But he's gone to his place. And Jesus also says, it has been better for you if you had not been born. But his spirit still lives in the church. Wherever he has gone, that is not our concern. What our concern is that the spirit of Judas is still there in the church today. It lives. It lives in all those who play the religious game. Who try to put on a religiosity instead of being spiritual. The spirit of Judas is in those who come to church for what they can get out of it rather than what they can give to the church. The spirit of Judas is in those who are pretending to have a commitment for Christ, but then they are not real in their hearts. 
the spirit of judas lives in those who know the rules but they are not willing to obey it is the spirit of judas remember the shock of judas betrayal was that he looked so good on the outside that he was trusted with the mission to proclaim the gospel he looked so good that he was trusted with the money he was the best and the trustworthy as they thought while all the while for two or two and a half years he was just planning to betray the son of man now the question what would it take for you and for me today to betray the son of god would we betray our faith in jesus to make more money through ways of compromising in the world would we betray the son of god to make more money to compromise with something else would we betray our loyalty to jesus for a better job somewhere else would we betray jesus to save our own skin or would we betray jesus because he didn't answer us to our expectation the miracle did not come to my expectation he did not answer me all these years so i am going to betray my trust this story on the third day of the holy week causes each one of us my friends to rethink of our basic commitment to jesus christ now that is all that is on the third day of the holy week what is my commitment to christ it is that basic that question and basic as it is this story though it is very mysterious why he did what he did yet the question is very simple what is my basic commitment to christ and there are serious questions also that we must ask are we true followers of jesus christ and are we pretenders of true believers of jesus the savior are we pretending all this just to show that we are christians and win some soaps from the church after all if one can be an apostle and still be lost what about you and me if there could be one apostle and still be lost what about us one apostle was lost that none should presume and 11 were saved that none should despair there was one apostle who was lost that none should presume and there were 11 who were saved yet it gives you nothing to despair yes we all fail as disciples i fail you fail everyone fail as disciples of jesus in many ways but we are still called to be ambitious to love jesus through the power of the holy spirit and claim his victory over all our unrighteousness don't tell me that judas iscariot did not have the power or the spirit upon him jesus blew upon them at one point of time the spirit and they received it do not make a deliberate attempt to betray the son of god for money for security for high expectations from god and then also don't betray him to save yourself he has saved you you have nothing to lose he's got your back matthew 26:24 woe to that person who betrays the son of man it would be better for that person if he or she had not been born lord jesus we come before you we know that we are fragile weak sometimes we may be strong yet lord we know that the spirit of judas is among us but lord we pray that you would deliver us from that spirit of juda judas and give us lord the spirit of your spirit the holy spirit that would imbibe within us mold and shape us to be truly your disciples we can't do that on our own and therefore we confess this evening that we are ignorant about many things and sometimes we do fail and sometimes we deliberately sin but lord we don't want to come that far to betray you for money for security for expectations or even to save ourselves father we pray that you would press upon us the gift of your spirit again so that we know that we have to live by your spirit and not by the spirit of judas in jesus name we pray amen